Hello guys, welcome to my show. In this podcast episode, you'll meet with a family of two art collectors, Stephen Allen Bennett and Dr. Elaine Melody Schmidt. Um, they established the Bennett Collection of Women Realists in 2009 and they limit themselves to figurative realism painting. The family of two collectors focus on collecting art of a specific art style. Their collection consists of figurative realism paintings of women created by female artists. So the collection includes work by some of the most exciting uh, women painters currently working, including Julie Bell, Margaret Bolan, Annika Ingold, Alyssa Monks, uh, Katie O'Hagan, and uh, many more. By visiting their website, thebennettartcollection.com, you can see the entire art collection. The couple also established the Bennett Prize to empower female figurative artists to pursue and expand their artistic careers. It gives an award, a $50,000 award to a woman artist uh, to create her own solo show of figurative realist paintings. Um, but today I'd like to talk about even more exciting news. These beautiful uh, people donated 12 million to create a, a museum space uh, for women artists. Now the public is about to see the art collection of women figurative painters in a permanent display by visiting the Muscogan Museum of Art in Michigan. I think this is super exciting. I think it's amazing to see that uh, female artists can finally uh, be noticed and collected on such a scale. I think it's a permanent change in the art world where we can enjoy realism painting. It's, it's wonderful to see that women artists finally get noticed. I think this museum expansion uh, will contribute to the American culture. I think what's truly admirable about Dr. Elaine and Stephen are their will to go against the art market trends and actually carve out their own path in art collecting that has a very clear purpose and social impact for generations to come. I'm so excited to see you guys. Well, thank you for inviting us. Good to, good to be here. Good to be with you. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine. How are you guys? I think we're good. Good. Where do you live? Where are you currently? Um, I live in Naples, Florida. Okay. And yeah. how long have you lived in Naples? Oh, about nine, ten years already. I used to live in State College, Pennsylvania, but then we moved over here. Okay, so that's Penn State. That's, mm -hmm. Penn, that's Penn State world, I think, is it not? Yeah, yeah. I got my master's degree from Penn State. That's pretty terrific. Actually. But it's cold in the winter. Whew. Yeah, I was tired of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you're, a, you're a native of Russia? Yes, I'm Russian. Mm -hmm. I live uh, in okay. Moscow. Well, those winters aren't exactly the easiest on Earth, are they? Well, it's actually very similar to Pennsylvania, believe it or not. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, I lived in Moscow. I didn't live in Siberia. <laughs> yeah, well, there is a difference between Moscow and Siberia, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, could. <laughs> and I do appreciate your time being on my show. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Glad to be with you. The first thing I want to discuss just uh, art collecting in general, and then I'd like to discuss your um, donation and involvement with the museum. Is this okay? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, how did you start collecting art? What motivated you? 
bare walls. Bare walls, seriously? <laughs> bare, wall, bare walls. And uh, we thought about all kinds of things that we could put on the walls. And we decided that women's art at the time was as good as the men's, more, more readily available, and it cost less. And so that was the beginning of the collecting journey for us, for sure. What about you, Dr. Elaine? What do you think? How did you start? Well, that is actually how we started to collect art. And then once we got started, we enjoyed it. And we saw there was so much good work out there. And we started to, we always had done gallery hopping because we liked art. Mm -hmm. But once you, once we defined our parameters, it was actually more fun because you were kind of on the hunt for the <laughs> best figurative realism done by women, of women. And it, we, we like all kinds of work. We like work done by men too. But when you've um, set your own parameters, mm -hmm. um, it it makes it a little more challenging. Mm -hmm. And we enjoyed it. And we enjoyed it. Then we, well, then honestly, we started to email and meet some of the artists. And they're such interesting people mm -hmm. that it became a very rich undertaking for us. Because not only did we have the art in our lives, but then we were meeting all these fascinating people that, that we enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Fair? All true. Hey, you, you, <laughs> you, said, you said it perfectly. What do you find exciting about painting? It transcends reality, right? You can always, you can paint something that you can't create in reality. It, it, sometimes the, uh, the work can only exist because it existed first in the imagination of the artist and then their skill allowed it to go onto the go onto the canvas. But we like that part of it. We love the narrative stories too. Mm -hmm. Narrative matters in our collecting, narrative matters. Oomph. Oomph, you know oomph? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Oomph. We, I like to call it paintings that have oomph. That's the, the intangible that makes you want to look at them. Oh, okay. If, if, you walk into, if you walk into a room and you see a painting and you go up to it and you can't stop looking at it, that's oomph. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, that's oomph, right? It is. It we is. like oomph. Sometimes photographs don't capture oomph. You have to see the work in, in person. Mm -hmm. sometimes yeah I think that's true yeah a lot of it is seeing it in person because photography doesn't do the justice I, I think we have different emotions when we look at art in person as opposed to seeing in the picture one of the problems with the uh, computer is that all the canvases are reduced to pictures this big you look yeah. at them or maybe this big on a screen and it, the monumentality of the work is frequently lost altogether when you look at it online. Uh, you, you know, you walk, you look at it, you can look at a painting that's 20 feet wide and online it, on your computer screen, it's that big. Mm -hmm. it, it's very hard to uh, conceptualize the monumentality of artwork on a computer. Right. Elaine, what do you find exciting about painting? Is it oomph? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 well, oomph is part of it. <laughs> I think the story, you know, I, I like paintings to tell a story and um, different emotions. We've intentionally tried to have a collection that's pretty broad in terms of the ages of the women in the collection, the mm -hmm. feelings they might be experiencing, the stories they might be telling. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like color too. I have okay. to admit, um, color can really draw me to a painting. And we have paintings that are um, great, primarily gray. So it doesn't always have to be a bright color, mm -hmm. um, but colors important to me.
Okay. It, it is. Amen. I'm with you. <laughs> so how how do you find art? Do you uh, look at it online? Do you go to art galleries, art shows, museums? Like, what's your way of finding? Of, we do all of that. <laughs> <laughs> we follow artists on Instagram, Facebook. Sometimes artists will send us pictures of what's on their easel. Mm -hmm. uh, we read journals. Um, we go to galleries. We go to museums. Um, auctions. Mm -hmm. we, we buy some paintings at auctions. During COVID, of course, mm -hmm. it was done online and paper. But... Um, yeah, we we enjoy, as I said, we enjoy the hunt, especially Steve. Steve's a really good researcher. Yeah, we're always on the hunt. Yeah, and but like, like, like you, you, um, you live in Texas, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you visit like local gal galleries or do you actually travel uh, to find the art? Oh, we, we're on the road all the time. Um, yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're um, what do they call it? Tennis pro, a tennis bum? We're museum <laughs> bums. We're, you know, we're museum bums. We uh, <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like museums and hang out a lot. Uh, uh, we go to art museums frequently. So that's one thing. Uh, we go to art galleries quite a bit. We were just in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which mm -hmm. is kind of a massive, you know, the whole place is an art gallery. Yeah. And we visit a bunch of art galleries there. And uh, we, we go to like Art Basel in Florida and mm -hmm. The Armory Show and the show in Chicago. Sofa. Sofa and the one on Navy Pier. And we've never been to the one in LA. But sometimes when you go to those shows, even if you don't find something, then you um, find new galleries mm -hmm. that maybe represent the kind of artists you like. And so um, then we'll sign up for their newsletter. Or sometimes we actually buy the shows. It just depends upon what's there. Mm -hmm. So. You just, you know, and people are, if you tell them you're interested in, it's it's actually quite narrow, figurative realism mm -hmm. done by women of women models. Mm -hmm. that, that really limits it. And so the people who sell that kind of stuff are willing to send us, you know, if something that they think is in our wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you have your favorite show or favorite museum? No? <laughs> oh, golly. Noya Gallery in New York, wouldn't you say? Yeah, our current favorite. Our current our favorite. Current, I've changed it. <laughs> we saw a fabulous show at the Noya um, in November that okay. was just astounding. And But before that, you know, we had seen some fabulous shows before COVID at the Tate. So that was our favorite museum at the, for a while. It, it, it depends upon the shows, I guess. Tate Britain and Tate Modern are both wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very different museums, but we saw the, uh, I think the show was entitled 1938. It was the work, all of Picasso's work gathered together that he had done in 1938 at the age of 50. And they found every single painting and then displayed them temporarily from the first painting he did to the last painting in 1938. Uh, and so the, the, that was Tate Modern, wasn't it? And they had a Lucian Freud show going on at the same time. So we, we, we like the Tate. You can't fall. The Neue Gallery is L Leonard Lauder's um, a museum right around the corner from the Frick, and it specializes mainly in German expressionism, a lot of German expressionist work. And it's really, and we like German expressionist work. So uh, the German expressionist women now are 
very hard to collect because their work wasn't abundant. There weren't very many of them and now everybody's on onto it, right? So like Dodo Wolf or uh, golly, I started down this path. Dodo, Dodo's, Dodo, Jeune Ma Men would be another example. Dodo Wolf, Jeune Ma Men. There's a whole group of them. And um, the Weimar women? Yeah, the, Vi the, Weimar, the Weimar women that became abstract you know, German expressionists. Uh, there's a bunch of them and they're all very collectible now. Uh, we, uh, I have a couple of Dodo Wolfs on the wall over here. She's, she's a favorite painter okay. from historically, a mm -hmm. historical painter. How, how did you decide to focus on um, women artists? Like what was your, how, how did you come up with the idea? Um, we initially, we kind of surveyed what was available in the art world. That was about 12 or 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of good work being done by women that wasn't being purchased. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was a double benefit. We felt we felt we could promote women's women's work and women's rights by buying their work and also we could buy better piece you know better pieces because they were cost less mm -hmm. and so um our money went further mm -hmm. by buying women and then once we got into it we just we gravitated towards figural work and uh it, it made our collecting decisions easier if, uh, if all you collect is a painting of a woman by a woman, you can get through the catalog pretty quickly and know whether or not it has anything in it that you're interested in. So uh, by creating that limitation, it really made it very easy to know what you wanted to look at real hard. I think general collectors who collect, you know, art, painting, and they collect men and women, abstract and figurative, realist and not realist. They have a much harder time, I think. Generalists have a much harder time collecting than uh, those of us who have a very limited uh, a limited uh, focus so I take for example this is the this is the the current Christie's Christie's catalog for the shows coming up this is it and it's big and it's mm -hmm. got I mean it, it's got 500 pages well we can whip through this thing in about 45 minutes and know what fits our collection you can look at the other work and admire it. There's some beautiful work in here, but like take this one. This is Magritte. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Magritte's a surrealist, but in this particular case, this painting, he's a man and it doesn't have any figures in it. So it's real easy to make decisions as you go through a catalog about what you would really like to study more and know to collect. And there's some wonderful work in here that we'd love to own. Just, ter just terrific stuff. Right. But, but we have our limits, so we can know in this catalog what, is, what fits and what doesn't and know relatively quickly. I think you begin to influence a whole new generation of collectors with your idea of collecting women artists. So it's very admirable. Thank you. Well, well thank you. I, I, will, I would say if you have collectors in the audience, I, I'd say that it is significantly easier to find some, a niche that you like and in our case, we liked figurative work with narrative qualities mm -hmm. and oomph <laughs> and oomph. 
And so if you can find figurative work with narrative qualities and oomph, and that's what you gravitate towards, then make that the thing that you want to collect. We liked we liked the work, the, the, the women's eye. We liked what the women saw because they see things a little differently sometimes. We liked the way they saw. And so we decided we would collect that work. But you could just as easily say uh, we were talking to somebody uh, within the last couple of days who was very impressed by uh, Netsuki's uh, uh, ivory figurines done by Japanese artists. And they can frequently, they can be figures or dragons or animals, lizards, this sort of thing. And they're very small and they're very collectible. And there are some people that have you know, these ivory carvings, if they have uh, jeweled eyes, uh, this sort of thing, they become very valuable. Well, you could collect that just as readily as you could collect figurative realist paintings. And you could be equally as valid as uh, respectable or valid as a collector doing that. So pick your pick what you what turns you on and then collect it. Do you collect? Um, I, yeah, I have a very small collection, but yeah, I do collect art once in a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so do I'm you a... have a particular niche you like? What do you collect? Um, I like realism, but I also bought some abstract art as well. I, I cannot say that, you know, I'm not at your scale, guys. <laughs> Well, but, but you can still have, a, have an ethic about how, whether you buy a lot of art or a little art or no, just painting. Little, or, I know. bought several pieces over the years. Yeah, but I, I'd like to do more of it. So what does your family think of your art collection? <laughs> Nobody's ever asked us that. Well, here we go. <laughs> there you are. Well, that's... I, you know, I, it depends on which part of the family. If you talk about our children, I think they are politely interested, but not, <laughs> they're, they're not on a sincere level. They're not deeply interested. You know, they, they're kind of interested, but not really. It's just, mm-hmm. it's not their thing. They'll tell us, they will notice when we change out the ones they really like, because we alternate our art. Mm-hmm. And they will tell us if we bought, you know, if we have a new acquisition that they really like. They, yeah. they will tell us kind of the extremes. Mm-hmm. But in the middle, you know, if you say to them, okay, everybody's got to vote, which is your favorite painting, yeah, they will participate. But they tend not to be visual. Yeah, I I think we just, you know, people are either visual or they're or they're auditory or they they you know there's a subset of people that would much rather read a novel with a lot of long paragraphs and single space. And there are people that like picture books, but magazines and pictures. Graphic novels. Graphic novels. They like graphic novels. And uh, so I think our kids tend to be uh, a, a non-visual. They they tend to <laughs> they are they, they they are different than that. I think our uh, siblings, uh, your siblings, certainly have an interest in interest in the collection, take an interest in it. Uh, but uh, art is not. Um, an avocation for anybody in the family other than us. We don't come from a long line of art collectors or, uh, you know, my granddaddy wasn't an art collector, so I had to be one. Yeah, they, they've been supportive, our children as well as our siblings, of um, the prize when we formed the prize. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we did collaborate with them before we gave the gift of our collection to the Muskegon Art Museum because they might have expected it to go to them. Mm -hmm. Um, So before we got very far down that path, we 
talked to them about our idea and everybody was 100% on board, which of course mattered a lot to us. Um, they're all generous children. They're all generous yes, in I their think own way. They're generous in their own way. And true. so that's a blessing. You know, that's a blessing mm -hmm. for us. Mm, true. If you enjoy watching this interview or you really love my podcast, please uh, review it on Apple or Spotify or any of the platforms you are subscribed to. Send me a screenshot of your review and I'll give you free access to one of my video courses uh, titled uh, Art Mini Course. Thanks so much. Well, you donated 12 million in art and cash uh, to the museum <laughs> yeah. to build a... Good thing we talked to our kids, huh? <laughs> yeah. Could you tell me more about it, about this entire project? How did you start? working with the museum? When we were collecting, as I said, we would talk to the women artists. And out of that, we saw the need, um, a lot of women artists struggle to paint part-time or full-time. Mm -hmm. A lot of them you know, have family responsibilities or mm -hmm. single parents or et cetera, et cetera. So that's when we decided we would do the Bennett Prize. Mm -hmm. which is the biennial prize of $50,000 to figurative women who paint in the figurative realist fashion, who are established but not totally launched. It's designed not for students, but for people who have developed kind of their artistic niche. And this is to give them the space to paint. So when we did that, we donated our money to the Pittsburgh Foundation and part of the prize is that you get a solo show at an art museum, as well as your the initial work of the final 10 finalists um, goes in a two year traveling show. So we needed a, a host museum. Mm -hmm. And so we interviewed different museums and we had met the director of the Muskegon Art Museum and Muskegon is from Michigan. I'm going to show your viewers. It's right here on Lake Michigan, oh, yeah. higher, <laughs> right higher, there yeah. on the lake, below the knuckle by your little finger. Because um, everybody says, where's Muskegon? It's right there. <laughs> uh, kind of between Traverse City and Saugatuck. And we had met her in, in the Hamptons at an art show, actually. And we liked her. So when we were trying to come up with the components of the prize, we called and talked to her and got to know her. So when we were interviewing museums, long story short, we interviewed them and we selected Muskegon. They got it. They got it. So they have been the host museum for the Bennett Prize for four years. And they've done an exceptional job. They're down to earth, they're practical, they're flexible. Um, we've gotten along very well with them. And that's how, well, we have different stories. Our, our, our recollections diverge at this point, how we actually came to give it to Muskegon. So I don't know how much time we have if you want my version or Steve's version. <laughs> <laughs> it, does, it doesn't matter. The, the bottom line is we had a pre-existing relationship with Muskegon and they decided they were raising funds to build a new wing. The current museum is 20,000 square feet with 5,000 objects. They don't particularly focus on women because the collection is largely historic. And so we uh, decided to contribute to their effort to build a, I think the new wing will have pavilion. Uh, the pavilion, the new wing, the the Bennett Schmidt Pavilion will have 26,000 square feet and will also have an, a gallery dedicated to women artists, which was one of the big selling points for us. We thought that was really important. Mm -hmm. This is really exciting. Is it the first museum that has the collection we, of women's well, we, art? We've done Google searches. Uh -huh. I would say 
you know, you have like a George O'Keefe museum, which is right. To, but in a large museum, there are maybe five intern. This will be the fifth one as far as we can fit, find internationally. Wow. So it's rare. And we also, in our discussions with them, it doesn't have to be paintings done by women. It's any kind of art. Mm-hmm. So it could be tapestry, fabric, glass, sculpture. Um, but there will always be a presence of high quality work done by women on the um, show at Muskegon, which we think is really important for society. Yes, and for the women. And for the, the men. Well, the men too. <laughs> sure. For um, everyone. I agree with you, dear. <laughs> I agree, I'm with you. So when is it going to open? The Muskegon, uh, p- the pavilion in Muskegon, uh, they're targeting 2024. Uh, it'll all depend on the availability of materials, frankly. Uh, you know, building a, uh, building a museum with concrete and steel and lumber all in short supply, a lot of it's going to be very dependent on the availability of construction materials. But they are targeting 2024, early 2024 for the opening. Uh, I think they've already, they've technically, they've ceremonially broken ground ceremonially, and they have actually had a shovel come in and <laughs> dig dirt. So I think they are underway. The construction is actually underway. Yeah, it's uh, it's a fantastic news. I I think, yeah, it's it's quite amazing, <laughs> and I'm happy for you guys that you you are able to do this. Oh, you're you. kind to say it. Thank thank you. We're we grateful we can do it. We're we're lucky, you know. We're lucky that we can do it. So we're grateful to to do it. Why do you think art is important? Well, okay, but you and I, I think, share this, uh, this view. I, you know, art lifts the soul. It uh, takes you to a place that you can't go by any other means. I, you know, art and uh, literature analogize. Uh, they both, uh, you know, great literature takes you into a world that you otherwise couldn't inhabit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It can be- think of Tolstoy. You come... You come from a country that's filled with uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy. I mean, you go down the list of the, the great Russian novels and they take you to a world that you could not inhabit th- that world of, on your own. And art does the exact same thing, only it does it visually uh, rather than conceptually, sometimes conceptually too. But great art takes you to a place you, you might not otherwise be able to get. What about you, Dr. Elaine? Well, I, I agree with what Steve says, but I think art can also send a message mm-hmm. um, that doesn't have to hit somebody over the head. Maybe they construct it themselves. And I think both the creation of art and the viewing of art can be therapeutic. hmm has a very positive powers of growth and healing. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's sometimes we we saw one show at the Tate actually. It was the first show. It was the first photographs ever taken of soldiers after World War One because. Um, the, the governments would never allow it because it was so gruesome and awful. And so it wasn't a touchy-feely good show, but it was certainly a powerful, this is what war does to people. And mm-hmm. that's just as important of a message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. So and- you, you, you like the humanity expressed through art, through art, right? Yeah. Right. You know, the other, the other reason we picked... Uh, representational art, figurative realism, uh, you can actually send a message that 
everybody gets kind of, mm -hmm. when you see a representational painting, if you look at an abstraction, it may or may not evoke the same response in the people who see it. Whereas if you're trying to make comment or have a, make a commentary on uh, politics or uh, philosophy, you're much more likely to get a message that people will grasp if you use the realistic style as opposed to abstraction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> oh, come on. You, you cannot experience what you see in abstract art. I mean, maybe it can give you some emotions, but you cannot connect fully. In it can be, yeah, I would, you, it can be aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it, maybe it doesn't go further than that. So all the people who love abstract art are going to say. Well, and we're not against abstract art. We're just making the point that realism and figurative work has a more likely possibility. If you wanted to say something about oppression or war or sexual equality, you can get those messages more capably delivered using realism as distinct from using abstraction to do that. Yeah, it's a very good point. Yeah. Well, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we quit for today? <laughs> it's a very short conversation, but. What's your thinking, doctor? You've always got a parting shot. Well, I guess I would say. <laughs> Go ahead. Just as we alluded to earlier, if you want to collect, figure out what would move your soul. And I, and I think the other part of that is if you look around, figure out how you can contribute to the world to make it a better place. Mm -hmm. What, and because everybody needs to do something um, and it needs to be different some things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other side of the same kind of the same idea, like figure out what you can do and that you want to do and do it. Yeah, I agree with all that. I have, I have a thought and the thought is this, you don't have to be a millionaire uh, or have a, even any money really to collect art, uh, you know, help, Collect what you like and find out who's making that work where you live locally and collect it. You know, there's a, an artist here locally who collects a lot of drawings mm -hmm. and he has started collecting many years ago and his drawing collection, his idea was that he could spend $100 or $200 on a drawing. And now he has a very, very impressive and extensive collection of drawings and none of them were a purchase for more than a couple hundred dollars. But over time, the work has, the work and the artists have gotten better known and his collection is now very valuable, I think. And if not valuable in a monetary sense, it's valuable in a documentary, uh, a documentary sense. Uh, so collect what you like and and uh, you don't have to collect in the million dollar range to be a collector. You can be an effective collector. You can spend $500 a year and be a very effective collector if you set your limits and know what you're looking for. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I think we need to have more people who collect art. And you made a very important point that it, you don't have to spend a lot uh, when you start collecting, that's for sure. No, I don't true. think so. Yeah. I don't think so. Well, well <laughs> wish you all success. Thank you for interviewing us. We really appreciate the chance to be with you. Thank you very much. And uh, good luck with your own work, you know. Thank uh, you. I, I'm, honored. I'm honored to have you on my show. Thank okay. You. Please we'll, do. We'll we appreciate it. Then. But thank you so much for meeting Thanks. Us. Great talking you. with you. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. See ya. <laughs>
I hope this interview will encourage you to start collecting art or at least buy a few artworks from contemporary artists living all around you. You can start small and on a budget to bring art to your home that inspires you and helps living artists to continue painting. Uh, you can always contact the artist directly, visit their studios and be open to learn about contemporary artists and their inspiration. Thanks so much for watching uh, this video or listening to this podcast. If you would like to learn more about this wonderful uh, couple, uh, you're welcome to visit their website at thebennettartcollection.com. See what they've collected over the years. You can also find information about the Bennett Prize. You can stay up to date with news and events from the collectors if you subscribe to their mail list. And if you'd like to learn more about my art, please visit my website, veronicasart.com. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Uh, take care. Bye-bye.